Hello and welcome to GMOs Revealed. I'm your host, Dr. Patrick Gentempo, and I have to tell you that over the next nine days, we are going to be going on one heck of a journey. I've been a healthcare provider for many years, and I've worked in many aspects of healthcare, including healthcare activism. Why is that necessary? Because things like GMOs exist on the planet, and the toxins that are sprayed on them are in our environment, and it affects everybody, and those effects are probably more serious than you understand. We traveled thousands of miles talking to the greatest experts on varying issues related to GMOs, and what we found was literally jaw-dropping. So over the next nine days, this journey is going to take you to places and introduce you to people that's going to transform your life and help upgrade the health of the people that you care about. So let me share with you how this is going to work. Over the next nine days, we will release a new episode each day. Those episodes will be released at 9 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States. They will play for a full 24 hours, so this way you can plan your days and determine at what point in that day works best for you to watch the episode. You are going to love this information. You will see that the information builds over the nine days, and we promise to deliver an extraordinary amount of value each and every episode, day by day. And now to prove this point, let me tell you about episode one. Episode one starts with Dr. Zach Bush. And I have to tell you that I have not been this impressed with a human being in a very long time. Dr. Zach Bush is a multi-board certified medical doctor who also has a background as a cancer researcher and now runs and directs his own lab amongst other activities. His depth of knowledge and experience relative to GMOs and their effects on your health is mind-blowing. We actually have three different parts with Dr. Zach Bush throughout the series. Part one is in episode one, and we're leading off with that, and you definitely want to watch that. Next, we have a person who's got millions of followers on the internet, and she's known as the food babe. Her name is Vani Hari. Listen to what she has to say. I think you'll find it very intriguing, very inspiring, and something that will alert you to things that are necessary to understand. And then we close out episode one with my interview with Gunnar Lovelace, the CEO of Thrive Market. We did that interview at Thrive Market offices, and I have to tell you that the environment there was very upbeat and exciting. They have an incredible operation of positively minded and motivated people who have a purpose in the world. And Gunnar is an extraordinary CEO. I would call him a visionary CEO who is doing something in the world that really matters. When you listen to his intelligence and his focus and what he wants to bring to the world through Thrive Market, it's going to be inspirational for you because with all the challenges that GMOs present to you, Thrive Market is a solution. And as a matter of fact, they are the largest retailer that has exclusively non-GMO products. So you can know that anything you'd get from Thrive Market doesn't contain GMOs. And as you're watching our series, you're going to understand why that's important. So please enjoy episode one. Zach, thanks so much for coming and talking to us. Uh, can you tell us your name and your background? Give us a bio sketch. My name is Zach Bush. I'm a medical doctor. I trained in allopathic medicine with my MD. I started at the University of Colorado. Uh, that journey started with a, a missions trip that I did to the Philippines. I was going to be an engineer and had the opportunity to go over and work with an international group of midwives over in the Philippines. And they had an extraordinary opportunity for me to really see a whole different side of humanity than I'd ever experienced before. So I was only 19 and went over there and started birthing babies in the squats of the Philippines and it completely changed my entire worldview and came back from that realizing that uh, engineering suddenly seemed boring and <laughs> there was an opportunity to engage humans on a new level there. And so I decided to go in medicine. I didn't have a real aptitude for the, my studies or school before that. I was a mechanic and passionate about rebuilding cars and things like that. And so it was a big transition for me to slowly over the next few years realize that I was capable and interested in become, going into medical school and taking that kind of rigorous academic journey. Ultimately, I uh, got accepted to the University of Colorado, went through medical school there and really found my pace intellectually for the first time in my life where I suddenly found school easy, everything started making sense and I really excelled. 
And so did very well there and then went on to the University of Virginia to a uh, residency in internal medicine, which was three years of the whole scope of general adult medicine from kind of cardiology to on oncology to renal and the whole spectrum. Uh, after that, I uh, was promoted to chief resident and did a whole teaching year at the University of Virginia, teaching medical school, med medical students, residents, and then went on to a fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism, which was three years of study in the areas of hormonal control of the body, uh, glands, and metabolism, which is the mitochondria and how they control cellular function. And then uh, during that time, I got into cancer research and I was doing tumor research under the microscope and then managing diabetes and autoimmune diseases and that kind of stuff in clinic. And through that experience, I really started to transition my worldview uh, to realize that uh, the chemotherapy I was helping design and things like this were really a chasing after the wind. Uh, it turns out that cancer is not caused by a lack of chemotherapy. <laughs> and so that, that took a little bit of time, four years of kind of that journey to realize, wait a second, there's no way this is the solution. And uh, at the same time, I was seeing that insulin and all these diabetes medicines were making my patients more diabetic, not less diabetic. And, and so it was a real deconstruction of the pharmaceutical model that I had been 17 years in the training for. So um, I think ultimately our, our educational journeys are really dictated by our willingness to deconstruct what we've already learned. And if we're willing to constantly question what we've learned so far, then we can guarantee the opportunity to continue to learn. And that's... Uh, something that I got into in the, in the mid-2000s there and over the last 10 years I've had the journey of every day waking up realizing I know almost nothing and have the experience of discovery in my life. And so I went on after that uh, from the University of Virginia. I started a, uh, a nutrition center in a nutrition clinic to manage and reverse chronic disease through food. And through that journey, I uh, found myself back in research and development, back to start my own laboratories and have an incredible array of scientists behind me now, uh, creating a, a whole new understanding of our relationship to the world and, and our biology to the ecosystem. And so that's a little bit of my journey. That's great. So, but you have uh, two board certifications? I finished internal medicine and then endocrinology and metabolism with those two boards. And then after the University of Virginia, really feeling like I had not really found a, a, a niche that I felt like I had completed, I went on into a third specialty in hospice and palliative care. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was the one experience I had in the ICUs and the bone marrow transplant unit and all of this of realizing this is the one area that I think that we have the opportunity to not mess up human biology is this transition from life to, to the rebirth of death. And so I went on to do that at hospice and palliative care. I was a, a associate medical director for a hospice service here in Virginia for uh, four years or so before uh, things really took off with our research and development. So what got you interested in GMOs? It was a, you know, my career, again, if you're willing to deconstruct and believe you know nothing, then the universe will show you what it wants you to know each day. And so my journey into GMOs was really an accident and, uh, or with great purpose. <laughs> and it turned out that my discoveries around bacteria and their role of communication at the cell level led to the exploration of soil and how my nutrition clinic was kind of seeing at least 40% of my patients fail with the best food on earth and to try to start asking, how is this food not delivering the medicinal effects that we expect it to do? And that took me down the journey of what is the soil? What is the soil giving to the plant? What is the plant giving to the human? And then that was this huge you know, avenue. And one of our chief science advisors is John Gilday, an incredible, brilliant PhD in, in genetics and microbiology. And he really uncovered this story of glyphosate, uh, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, which was the impetus for genetically modified crops that would be Roundup ready. And so through those, that back door avenue, found myself and our science group really being at the forefront of understanding how GMO and the chemical environment around that is affecting human biology. So let's go back then and give the historical context. You know, how did how this whole thing emerge where we live in this culture today where we have GMOs, glyphosate, et cetera, like, you know, ubiquitous, you know, in North America especially? Fantastic. And I, I think that's such an important topic in the sense that there's uh, there's a contentiousness in this field of GMO that's politically charged, socially charged, almost religiously charged, because it's the food. It's the food we're feeding to our children, and there's an emotional intensity to this topic. And one of the things that's weakened our position as consumers is the sound of, this almost sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? But in fact, it's not. This is just the march of 
human behavior and big business over a century. Uh, if we dial back 100 years ago, we were starting to destroy the topsoil of the planet, in, in the United States in particular. And what we were doing is we were failing to do crop rotation, we were failing to respect the soil's need for feeding and composting and these age-old farming practices. And that led to the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl started in the 1920s and then you know, coincided with the financial collapse that was really programmed in, I think, there at the end of the 20s. And so with the Great Depression that unfolded, we had the Dust Bowl that wiped out the crops and we had famine happening in the United States of America. In this time of plenty that we have today, where we have you know, the breadbasket of the world growing in our Midwest, it's very hard to imagine that that very same ground was dead and completely non-productive and led to this huge famine event in our own country. And so the, the food camps that were set up uh, in the 1930s to feed these starving families and everything else, that, that's just, you know, my, my, my grandmother was raised in West Virginia in that setting of starvation and collapse of the coal mining industry and all kinds of stuff going on. And so that was really what led in some ways to today's GMO chemical farming event. And the steps that kind of happened from my perspective really started with this machine of the World, world War II. And so we kind of pulled ourselves out of the re re depression largely because of the wind-up for the petroleum industry and the big manufacturing industry that would create this the biggest war machine ever seen on earth. We were pumping so much petroleum into tanks, ships, planes. We had this massive demand. And World War II ended and suddenly there was this glut of petroleum. And so the industry needed a new target. And it didn't take long to realize that in petroleum is nitri nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, three of the most critical macronutrients, if you will, for crops. And so it was this sudden shift from, let's put it into our tanks and planes, let's start making chemical petroleum-based fertilizers and put that into our soils. And so we really reversed you know, what was poor farming techniques and the collapse of what was going on with our, our soil management. And instead of really fixing that by going back to composting and all of these things, we instead just started dumping petroleum into our soils. And it led to something that would be termed the, the Green Revolution. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. You know, Green Revolution sounds like, you know, well, this must be the, the best thing that's ever happened to ecology. And it looked like it because suddenly we took dead crops and failing fields with no productivity to huge fields of green corn and soybean and all the rest growing in an abundance in the 1950s and 60s. So it looked like a boon. But we see this in human health just like we do in plant health. If you use just a couple of nutrients and you steal or, or remove many of the others from the food chain, you end up with a weak immune system. And so our plants started to fail. And so our crops started to be prone to insects and fungi and viruses. And so instead of again asking the root cause question of why is the health failing, we instead went to our chemical industries and said, you know, we've got viruses, we've got fungi, we've got pests, what can we do about it? And, the, and of course the chemical industry was eager to step up and put on, onto the table things like these chemical herbicides and pesticides to kill the weeds, to kill the bugs and everything else. And so that became this really big machine by the 1970s. And interestingly, there was still this interplay between the war machine and our food. Uh, Vietnam happened and it really refined our ability to kill plants. Remember Agent Orange? Yeah. The purpose of Agent Orange was to kill the jungle, to defoliate the trees so we could see the Viet Cong. And so that defoliation was a huge industry. And so Monsanto and some of these big chemical uh, companies got into that industry of killing plants and then Vietnam was over and suddenly, what are we gonna do with these chemicals? And one of the interesting things is that perhaps they found the perfect business model which is the only unifying feature of all humans, every race, creed, ma male, female, doesn't matter. The one thing that ties us all together is we don't like to weed. <laughs> 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 and so it was a brilliant business plan to come up with a solution where you no longer have to bend over and pull the weed out of the ground. You just walk around and spray these plants and wipe these things out. And so that I think is kind of the march of how we got to this convenience-based, chemical-based food chain that would really set the stage for the GMO era. So, so the companies that develop these uh, 
solutions, at least in their minds, uh, toward farming and having to uh, create better yield are the same companies that were involved in developing uh, you know, chemicals to support war efforts. Yeah. So basically, they, they refocused the lens from saying, hey, we have a war on human beings, now we have a war on uh, plants and weeds, uh, or bugs and weeds that yes. attack our crops, et cetera. So they're still at war, it's just where they're, where they're focusing the lens. And they're using foundational chemical elements and just repurposing them uh, where it makes sense to do so, at least in their minds. Yes. So what are the consequences of all these actions? So, so now emerges this, you know, this genetic uh, idea of you know, changing the genetics of, of certain crops uh, and then patenting that, if I understand, and then, of course, uh, selling chemicals you know, into that. So, so what's the next step now? How do we get to where we are today? It's definitely a refocusing, and it is an interesting culture that, that you point to there is that um, we see this in my clinic. I, I see a lot of women who are struggling with obesity and weight issues and collapsing metabolism, and they feel a war against their food. Mm -hmm. And you're pointing to the same relationship that we've been in a war battle mindset in our own farming practices that I think translate then into our own relationship to food. And so, uh, absolutely set this culture for this war on, on the outside world or germs, which has a nice correlation, of course, to the way we practice allopathic medicine. We believe we have to kill all the germs. We have to, you know, right. everything is antimicrobial, everything, and antimicrobial hand wipes and countertop wipes, and we're trying to kill germs all over the place, when in fact, you know, what we're really doing is creating monoculture and wiping out any biodiversity which is threatening our health. And so that mindset of war on plants uh, was very literal. And just like we do with antibiotics, you always need something better because one of the truths about biology and nature is it always finds a, a loophole, right? Mm -hmm. So if you try to put up an unnatural blockade, an antibiotic or an herbicide or a pesticide, nature's gonna find a way through there because nature has purpose that is perhaps seemingly uh, contrary to maybe our purpose to grow you know, one million <laughs> acres of a single crop of corn, you know? Right. That's not nature's style. Right. And so it's always gonna find ways to infiltrate. And so we started to see the emergence of, you know, uh, weeds that were resistant to a lot of these chemicals that had been de developed in the 1950s and 60s. And so uh, 1970s comes around and you see Monsanto change course with uh, the development of the organophosphates. This is a a group of toxins that are very specific to their structure. Uh, the organophosphates is, is where you, you find that Asian orange mm -hmm. uh, kind of family. And so this is the defoliating toxin that kills biology. They were turning their attention to find something that was less carcinogenic or less toxic to the human than Agent Orange. There was already you know, very early data making it clear that as soon as Agent Orange touched the skin, it was causing horrible rashes and immune problems in our soldiers in Vietnam and everything else. So there was realization that this was probably too potent of a toxin to be outside of the war mm -hmm. uh, context. And so they found uh, glyphosate, which uh, is the active ingredient in what would become Roundup, which is probably the single most you know, successful herbicide in the history of, of the industry. But that glyphosate is such an interesting molecule and in that is its backbone is glycine, which is an essential amino acid for human and any biologic life. There's only 26 amino acids, kind of like the letters of the alphabet to build a million words. You only need 26 building blocks to build a 70 trillion cell organism. Mm -hmm. And so one of those is glycine, and that's the backbone of glyphosate. So we take this you know, piece of nature and then we adulterate it with a phosphate group on one end and an amine on the other and that creates the toxin quality to it. And so organo, meaning built on an organic molecule of amino acid phosphate, is the, the family. Mm -hmm. The terrifying thing about that toxin is that it is water soluble. And nature makes the vast majority of its toxins in the form of lipid or fat soluble mm -hmm. toxin. And that's important because those toxins can be sequestered away by mycelium in the soil by the fungi, or can be sequestered away by your fat cells so it's not in your bloodstream to be exposed to your brain and other things. So fat-soluble toxins are kind of nature's approach. 
water soluble toxins, this man-made approach is very frightening because it goes everywhere. Mm. And once you dump this into the environment, it's gonna go into the water table, it actually evaporates and goes into our air, ends up in our clouds, rains back on us. So we create this whole ecosystem of toxin. How we got there was this discovery of, we need something that doesn't have a human biologic target that's obvious. Mm -hmm. And so uh, glyphosate had actually been discovered in the 1950s, around 57, 58 by a Japanese researcher. And he had uh, put it on the shelf, I think realizing that this, this toxin would be horrible in the environment. So he kind of discovered this organophosphate and had patented it. Monsanto bought that patent for pittance and then moved it into consumer use. And its first patents were really around its use as an antibiotic, not as a weed killer. Really? And so that is an interesting you know, little tidbit is that they understood what this toxin was doing to biology, even though they've claimed, you know, continue to claim that this doesn't have any human bio biologic toxicity to it. They knew that it was killing life at a very basic level at the anti at that microbial antibiotic effect of it. It's been repatented over the years as an antiparasite, as an antiviral, all these different things. And so they have seen that everything this touches, whether a plant or a bug, it kills. Mm -hmm. And the way in which it does that is interesting, that it actually blocks the ability of this enzyme pathway, which is called the shikimate pathway. These enzymes make the, uh, the ringed aromatic amino acids. So we already took one amino acid kind of out of the equation by, with glycine. And then by this glycine toxin organophosphate, we block the shikimate pathway and we suddenly lose the ability to make our ringed aromatic amino acids, which include things like tryptophan. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so what's the significance of that pathway, you know, just uh, to put it in more lay terms, like, you know, okay, so a pathway is blocked by the actions of this chemical. What does that mean? Exactly, and, and that's, you know, it's such a subtle, marketing tool that the companies have used. Uh, glyphosate's now made by every chemical company on earth. The five big ones in the US all make it. Uh, and most of it's actually made in China now. It came off patent in 2007. So everybody's making this chemical now. And what they continue to point out from a marketing standpoint is that, well, there is no human target because this enzyme pathway is just in bacteria and plants. Mm -hmm. And so if we put it there, it kills them. But since humans don't have this enzymatic pathway, the shikimate pathway, there is no target for glyphosate in the human. That's what they've been claiming. However, if you ask what is that enzyme pathway and what does it do, what it makes are what we call the essential amino acids, i.e. the amino acids the human body can't manufacture. The vast majority of, of the amino acids in those 26 we can make on our own. So yeah, what you're saying is that you know, so the amino acids are the basic building blocks. And there's m the majority of them that we can make on our own. Uh, we can just reconstitute yes. from the foods we're eating, et cetera. However, there's some that we need to, to receive from uh, you know, our dietary intake, right? And you're saying that, that glyphosate blocks the pathway to be able to uh, to create those or what actually happens? Exactly right. So four of those essential amino acids, so at least half of them are now taken out of the equation. And so they say, well, this isn't important for humans because it just happens in plants. Well, humans rely on that plant or that bacteria to deliver those essential amino acids that we can't manufacture. So we've literally robbed ourselves of a subset of, of the alphabet. Wow. Imagine if you woke up in the morning and had to go to work and be as productive as you are today, but you could only use 19 of the 26 letters. Right. Would you even be able to communicate? Right. So, so what happens is you start to, you know, it's not like you have nothing to communicate with, but it's, it's horribly compromised. Horribly compromised. So uh, now, is there still some um, assertion that human beings don't have to worry about this, or has anybody woken up to this particular issue? You know, certainly there are subsets of scientists that are super concerned, you know, are really screaming, this is the end of human biology if we don't stop this pathway. Mm -hmm. I think by and large, the consumer has been so confused and blinded by this constant marketing, constant messaging that, you know, genetically modified crops are a necessary thing to feed the world. Right. We have 7 billion people. We have to feed them. We would have starvation if we didn't have GMO crops. And I've heard that before. 
Um, and so what is your, what is your take on that? Uh, you know, is, is there validity to the assertion that without GMO crops, uh, we're gonna have worldwide starvation? My take is no, not even close. Uh, if we took GMO off the market today, we would still be fe feeding the world with the same inefficacy that we are today. We have starvation, we have the biggest famine in human history happening over in Sub-Saharan Africa right now. There is zero news coverage. Right. There is zero political interest in the fact that right now there's over 100 million lives at risk of, of dying from starvation in, in the plains of Africa right now. And uh, we have thousands and tens of thousands of people dying daily over there right now from starvation. So number one, we're not feeding the world, not because we're not growing food, but because we don't have the political infrastructure and the, and the societal awareness to distribute food correctly. So starvation is never a growth or, dis or production problem. I think it's always a political problem. Mm -hmm. Second piece of this is there was billions of people on the earth in 1995. 1996, we debuted GMO. We weren't starving of lack of production in 1995, so therefore we had to create GMO. So it's such an artificial argument that we would starve without GMO crops. We couldn't feed the world. It's totally bogus because we only have to back up 20 years to realize we were feeding the world then, we are feeding our world ineffectively even now with all of the GMO. Aren't we, I mean, aren't we currently paying farmers not to farm? So like they're saying the yield is beyond what our needs are and they're trying to manage the market politically by, by ask, actually paying people to not produce crop. Exactly, so this is the farm bill which is the most contentious and frankly, the most humanitarian, corrupt piece of legislation that I believe that we continue to put into play. Every administration over the last 30 years continues to sign that darn farm bill. And it's paying farmers to either grow the wrong crops or grow nothing at all. We literally are paying farmers to keep their fields fallow as kind of a reserve. And so we justify it through national uh, you know, security that, well, we need this backup of farmland and so we don't want everything in 100% production. So we have all these military weird, you know, so geopolitical arguments as to why we should pay farmers not to grow food. And yet simultaneously we have these big chemical companies arguing we have to have chemical farming to feed the world. And so none of it is true. I think that in fact we can feed ourselves. We don't even need mega farming on the organic level. Mm -hmm. In 1945, Americans were growing 45% of their food chain in Victory Gardens. And it wasn't just the US, all of the allied countries had put into play this public message of we need to grow our own food. And so it wasn't the chemical factory farming that rescued us from the Dust Bowl. It was the recognition that everybody needed to start growing their own food again. Mm -hmm. Because by the 20s and 30s, we were starting to really outsource what had been our backyard gardens to big farming, and that big farming destroyed our, crop, our soil by mistending the soil. But we regrew mm -hmm. healthy food to the point of 45% of our food chain being produced in our backyard gardens by 45. With developing urban areas, though, what, you know, what is the uh, implications of saying, hey, we got you know, not much land and a bunch of people stacked up on top of each other, so how is that handled in, in the way that you see things? I think that was one of the impetus for this outsourcing of the food for sure. You look at something like New York City or LA that in the 1920s and 30s were starting to become these huge you know, municipal centers and we were stacking more and more vertical. You know, All of those classic photographs of the first skyscrapers going up in New York and everything else with those, the steel workers and everything else. The, we were at a moment of transition socially where we were building human civilization different than it had been built in, in many, many years. But if we then go back further in time and say, well, what was, have we ever built like that? And the answer is actually yes, maybe not on the scale of a New York City, but we've actually built civilizations with really dense populations in Rome and lots of these you know, kind of high uh, kind of trajectory empires that have been around the world have concentrated humans to a degree where they couldn't grow food in their backyard. They had no backyard. Mm -hmm and yet they maintain a relationship to the land. And so uh, there's two warnings there. Is number one, they did still have farmers that were growing for small groups of people. And we're now doing this. We're starting to do CSAs, these community-supported agriculture projects where a local farmer says, I will grow you healthy food if you will commit to me as a consumer. And that's all it takes is a change in relationship, right? We need to stop 
you know, this kind of almost nebulous relationship to the food production and say, I want to know my farmer. And we're doing that now. And we can do it faster and we can do it more completely. And frankly, the GMO world is feeling threatened. And so uh, there's been some memos that have been leaked that say if we hit 16% of consumer behavior as fully organic food, the profitability for a Monsanto disappears. Wow. And so we are currently seeing the company that holds Monsanto selling that off to Bayer uh, in Germany. I think largely because they see the writing on the wall uh, that the American consumer is only a few years away now from that 16% tipping point where it becomes fiscally infeasible or uh, we steal away the, the fiscal uh, drive for this chemical farming approach. Now this is interesting and, and, I, and I want to maybe, we'll, uh, we'll double click on the Monsanto transaction that, you know, that's contemplated because obviously Monsanto has been called out as a big culprit in this whole anti-GMO movement that's been expanding over time. But I, I want to uh, continue on the timeline for a minute, because exactly. now you're saying we're in the 70s or post-Vietnam, they're, they're reconstituting Agent Orange and figuring out how to use that as, as a, a, a crop uh, you know, uh, uh, product, uh, you know, uh, a uh, anti, is, would it be anti-herbicide, I guess, would be yeah. what, what that was, how to basically uh, maybe dull it down so it's not as toxic to human beings, in essence, yeah. we talked about that. So now we're on this timeline, but we're still not into GMOs yet. We're still looking at, and I like the characterization, chemical farming. And it's interesting because, you know, as, as a healthcare provider, when I've looked at this also, you know, the idea of human beings trying to improve their health through better chemistry that's externally put into the body, you know, as, as you kind of said earlier, you know, people didn't get people don't get sick because there's a lack of drugs in their blood. There's something else going on. And when you're chemically trying to manipulate the system, there's always unintended consequences, most of which can't be known until you have a big enough population actually utilizing these chemicals. So I see the same principles apply to farming. So now we're dealing with a situation that, okay, these big, big chemical manufacturers, after the wars with people are over, they're, they're uh, repurposing their products to say, let's go, let's go to war on, on weeds and, and other things that might inhibit farm yield. But it's a while before GMOs are introduced. So what, what's the track now? You're in the 70s going to where GMOs are introduced. And it, do you have any of the background story you know, as to what was going on there? Yeah, I think, you know, I run a number of small businesses and I think it's just business. It's just good business. It's just necessary business practice. Every business will go through the, the curve of concept to a product to fast growth to plateau to needing to reinvent the marketplace or find a new niche in the market to, con to get another steep climb. And so in the 1970s, they got approval from the EPA to utilize this chemical for farming. Mm -hmm. And they, they submitted all of their own science of safety and said, you know, it's, you know, the EPA never asked for third party safety analysis and they've never since then had money to put forward to do their own safety analysis in the biology. And so they accepted the company's safety documents and said, well, it must only be the shikimate pathway, just plants. And so they started. And so they were able to start selling a, a new weed killer that was very effective. And so there was an initial growth, I'm sure, for their business, where they were suddenly selling more and more glyphosate every year in the form of Roundup. But it started to plateau in, in the 80s, I'm sure. And I don't have access to their books and their profit margins, but I can guarantee you that was true because they then went after approval to go direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. And so they went after that direct to consumer market. And in the 1980s, we had some of the most successful commercials that I think have ever been debuted and they were the direct-to-consumer ads for Roundup. You maybe remember these, it was like, it'd be break time at Super Bowl, and you'd be watching your Super Bowl commercials, and suddenly there's this suburban home, and dramatic soundtrack starts, and the garage door opens, and this guy comes out, a little bit of a belly, looks like your classic mid-American homeowner, and he's got a backpack on, and he's got two holsters, and he pulls out these sprayers, and starts shooting down the seven dandelions in his, <laughs> driveway, right. which are actually anti-cancer foods that are superfoods, but we'll come back to that later, but he kills the seven superfoods in his driveway and reholsters and turns around to the dramatic sound rack and emblazoned across the backpack is Roundup with the message, 
it's manly to not bend down and pull a weed. You should instead come out with guns and shoot them down. That's the manly approach to home ownership and gardening. That was so effective because no man wants to go out on Saturday and weed instead of watch football. And so it was the perfect mix of the football commercial, the, the empowerment of the war battle, shoot them down. It's just, it hit every male gene, you know, <laughs> receptor out there. And suddenly it was like we had the perfect consumer product. And so over the 80s, they saw very steep takeoff. So every Lowe's and Home Depot and all of these box stores started carrying a thousand versions of Roundup you can buy in little spray bottles or big spray bottles or backpacks or, you know, it was just like a million things. And to this day, you walk into any garage in suburban America, you're going to find Roundup yep. in there. And you can still go to any big box, you know, Home Depot or any other store, and you're going to find these chemicals all over the place. If I go to my local uh, uh, kind of agricultural co-op, they now sell it in, in 50 gallon barrels of glyphosate, generic glyphosate, 45% glyphosate for sale now, 50 gallon barrel, you know, it's just like, it's so ubiquitous in the industry. And so the behavior of the company was simply find that next trajectory. And by the 1990s, we were starting, I'm sure, to see that start to taper where they had saturated the consumer market we were dumping tons of glyphosate into our water systems by this time. An incredible statistic is only 0.1%, one thousandth of a percent of the glyphosate or Roundup that's sprayed worldwide actually hits its target. Wow. One thousandth of a percent, 99.99% of this chemical is going right into our water systems as wash off and never reaches its therapeutic target of the weed, if you will. And so, the consumer, I think the homeowner was the first to really misuse this chemical. We were spraying down things we didn't understand and it was washing into our gutter systems that then went to our municipal water processing plant. Organophosphates are super water soluble, very hard to pull out. And so we started drinking Roundup by the 1990s. And so that pattern happened, but we were starting to saturate the curve. So 1992 came around and, and the company needed a new niche. It said, okay, well these farmers are not using enough Roundup. Why? Because every plant that stuff touches, it kills. So they were having to spot spray the borders of their farms and everything else. And so Monsanto intelligently looked at the, the situation as like, there must be some crop that needs to be killed. And there is, it's wheat. And so in 1992, they went to the industry and said, we have an amazing new chemical for you that is a desiccant. So instead of calling it a weed killer, they called it a desiccant or drying agent. And this was a huge boon for wheat farmers, in, especially in northern climates of the U.S. Wheat has to not only mature, grow, go to seed and dry, it needs to be dry for a period of time and then cut and then lay dry for a couple days before it can be harvested effectively. If at any point in there it gets wet, you have to wait again for it to dry before you can cut it. And so it's dangerous to be a wheat farmer in northern climates because if you get an early snow or you start to get weather falling apart late, you can lose a whole crop and so you lose your crop. And so Monsanto came in and said, look, you can dry your wheat early. You don't, why are you going to sit there and watch the paint dry? Go ahead and just shoot your, your crop with Roundup, the whole wheat crop, and then you can harvest it three days later. It'll be dead and dry and you can just harvest early. Well, this, of course, immediately led to not only the possibility of saving your one crop, it meant that in slightly further south you could grow two crops, not one in a single growing season. So instead of watching that wheat grow to maturity, dry and die and harvest, they were watching it mature, go to seed, they'd kill it, harvest it, put a second crop in the ground, let that come, kill it, harvest it before winter came. And this is still pre-GMO. This words, is 1992 still. Yeah, so, so GMOs aren't even introduced, but they're still using the chemicals, chemicals in a way now to increase uh, more first, yield. First time that we had used it to speed a, an actual crop to market. It was the first time we'd actually applied glyphosate directly to a food item right before it harvested. Is there an absurdity though to saying, hey, take this crop and kill it? <laughs> you know, dry it? You know, in other words, is that like, did, did it bring rise to anybody saying, well, what is killing it? And it's on the crop that we're gonna eventually be eating. Two incredible questions. Has a shortcut ever been the right decision in nature? <laughs> right. In nature, exactly. Does, does it ever really 
work to outsmart nature? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always no. Mm -hmm. And this is an obvious one. And we do this in all kinds of more subtle ways in our food industry. Um, you think about, if you go to your grocery store right now, 365 days a year, you can go buy a ripe avocado. Right. Or you can go buy an apple. 365 days a year in any climate. All of these are symptoms of the fact that we're shortcutting nature. And so in the U.S. here, we, we eat an enormous amount of produce from South America during our winter months. And to get a crop, like a piece of fruit, from Chile to a grocery store shelf in New York in December, you have to do some shortcuts. Because if you really picked it ripe from the field, it would be rotted by the time it got to New York. So you have to pick it prematurely. And then it's ripened under ethylene gas that's in the, in the transport cases. They're feeding ethylene gas into it on the way to ripen the fruit artificially so that by the time it gets to New York and on your shelf, it's ripe, but it's not rotting. Mm. So if we, we take fruit that's been picked prematurely and then artificially ripened, or in the case of wheat, we kill it prematurely and we don't let the ripening process happen naturally, we obviously are going to lose nutrient quality to the food. Nature so designed every berry, every piece of fruit, every vegetable to be at its perfect moment when it's at its, its full potential. And, and that full potential is nutrient-wise, it's size-wise, it's everything is perfect. And so if we shortcut that and say, we're going to not let the wheat come, what's going to happen? We're going to change the carbohydrate to fiber ratios in that gluten. The gluten ratios to its fiber ratios are going to change. And so we suddenly started creating wheat that was abnormal for the body to handle. Simultaneously to this then, uh, we un unknowingly as consumers and farmers perhaps, but what we were doing is adding glyphosate, which would become a chemical that actually has a very synergistic effect with gluten. And so we actually created gluten sensitivity out of this one effect. Gluten sensitivity is a reality of biology. Our biology is sensitive to gluten, mm -hmm. but it's never in excess of it. So we should always be able to keep up with gluten. Gluten's been in our diet for thousands of years without a problem. Suddenly in the 1990s, there was this beginning phase of celiac disease, which is the autoimmune condition to, to gluten compounds. And then there was this huge new realization of, oh, oh my gosh, so many of us are gluten sensitive. We're having bloating, fatigue, brain fog, poor sex drive, infertility, insulin resistance, and all this. And then you take gluten out of the diet and people get better. Mm -hmm. That was really early in the 1990s. I mean, there was a few people, a few practitioners talking about it. But then you fast forward to 2008, 2010, 20 years now, 2012, with that wheat being treated with glyphosate, suddenly we have you know, somewhere around 18 million people in the United States alone that have been diagnosed with this, and probably 10 times that many that are gluten sensitive and don't know it yet. The biology of this is fascinating, and our, our research team will be publishing a paper in the next few months on this of the science that we've been doing over the last few years, but what we've shown is that glyphosate actually hits the cell membranes of the intestine and when it, when it does it upregulates the receptor for gliadin which is the gluten breakdown product that causes the gluten sensitivity leaky gut effect mm -hmm. and so unknowingly we not only created an abnormal crop with desiccant approach or early drying where we had high gluten to fiber ratios and all this abnormal nutrient quality of the food we also simultaneously had a toxin that was synergistic with the gluten products itself to cause this biologic damage. Sort of a perfect storm that starts to, you know, perfect form. storm. My name is Bonnie Hari and I'm the creator of foodbabe.com. I felt like it was an obligation on my behalf to educate the people around me and that's why I started my blog foodbabe.com is to tell people what's really happening in the food supply. Really tell them the chemicals that they're eating and also give them the strategies on how to rid themselves of all the chemicals they're being forced upon, of, that are being forced upon them, and um, give them the strategies and the tips and how to live in this overprocessed world. You know, um, someone like me who loves to eat and loves sweets and loves really great food, you know, it's, it, you know I'm not eating, you know, kale for every meal. You know, I'm eating real food, and when you make sure it's organic and non-GMO, you're gonna work wonders with your health and your body 
and you really could eliminate all of these hardships that might occur later on in life. And it's not only about living longer, it's about living the best you can now and like with the, as much energy as possible where you're climbing Mount Kilimanjaro at 60 and 70 and you're feeling like you've lived the life that you're supposed to live, that you haven't lived the life that you are sick and unhappy and no energy and just getting day by day, wishing for the weekend. You know, all of these habits that you see being instilled in so many people, wishing their lives away, wishing the time would pass. I wish there was more time with all the energy that I feel. Several years ago, I was living the typical American lifestyle, um, working crazy hours at a big consulting firm and traveling like crazy. And I was just right out of school, got this amazing job. And I wanted to be like everybody else around me, my coworkers who were striving to become, you know, partner and get to the next level and get promoted. And I saw this culture of work, 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 and I quickly became a part of that. And I started to feel really bad because I was eating what everybody else was eating, all of the catered meals like chicken parmesan and barbecue and um, all of this kind of industrial chemical filled food, which I didn't know at the time. I was eating that day in and day out, trying to keep up and work through lunches and breakfasts and dinners so that I could work uh, and be side by side with my coworkers. I mean, you know, you got there before your boss got there and you left after your boss left. And um, this started to really catch up with me to the point where I gained over 30 pounds. Um, I developed uh, really low energy and one day had a shocking pain in my right side to the point where I went to the emergency room. And there, the emergency room doctor told me nothing was wrong and sent me home. And if it wasn't for my parents' sixth sense, which was to go see another doctor the next morning, I might not be here today because that morning I had um, emergency appendicitis surgery, an appendectomy. And um, this was December of 2002, so a while back. And uh, it was a time period where everyone you know, has uh, parties and they're out shopping for the holidays and enjoying life and family and friends. And I was in a hospital room recovering from appendicitis and I didn't feel like this was right for a 22-year-old to endure. So I made a decision right then and there in the hospital bed that health would become my number one priority. And I was going to investigate what I'd been eating, what I'd been doing to cause this reaction in my body. And you know, all the doctors around me were telling me appendicitis is random. You know, It just happens to people. But what I found out was appendix, your appendix is actually in your digestive system. It's an organ in your digestive system. And if your digestive system's inflamed to make your appendix inflamed, then something you're eating, something you're doing is causing that reaction. And it's not so random um, is what I found out. And um, you know, I, I channeled you know, kind of all this energy that I learned in high school. I was a top nationally ranked debater. And every summer I'd spend away at debate camp researching the year's topic, and one year was healthcare. So I learned a lot as a high school student about healthcare and about what was really happening in the industry. And this is, you know, before the internet, before, you know, you could Google something. So I had to dig, dig deep into like law journals and periodicals and major, huge, big nutrition books to really find the truth. And I channeled all that energy after I left that hospital room and I started to determine what I needed to eat, what I needed to eat to heal my body, to heal myself, and what types of foods were causing all the issues that I had been experiencing, the weight gain, the low energy. Um, and what I found out was so startling and completely changed my life forever. You know, my whole life I had been suffering from eczema, asthma, I had eczema all over my face growing up and into my early 20s. I was on three or four medications for asthma. Um, I, every you know, major sinus season, I'd have to be on steroids. 
And one of the things I found out almost immediately is the way I'd been eating had been affecting these other things that I'd been living with my whole entire life, not even knowing. And so not only did I learn how to eat well and learn about what's really in my food and starting to figure out that there were genetically engineered ingredients snuck into my food in 1996, right after I had graduated um, uh, you know, high school, um, and finding out that uh, the majority of our foods being grown here in the United States have been sprayed with toxic pesticides, that the chemicals that food companies were using here in America were not the chemicals that they were using in other countries, and determining what the heck was really going on with our food supply and really trying to understand why 90% of the foods at the grocery store are either corn or soy. And just thinking about how unhealthy that is just to eat those two things that aren't very nutritious. They're not major, you know, uh, superfoods or anything. And um, what I found out was that my diet was 100% related to how I was feeling, how I was looking, and how many medications I was on. Um, you know, in my early 20s, I was on six to eight medications at a time whether it be for the asthma or the allergies I was having or the eczema. I mean, costocortisone creams that I would put on my face and spend big money on was all related to my diet that I changed and I cleaned up and I got rid of the chemicals and saw this dramatic improvement. It would be so nice to reach everyone before they get to the point where I was in this crisis moment and it would be really great to reach out to children and take them through a grocery store and explain to them what's happening to our food. With little children, one of the best places to start teaching them about food is in the vegetable and fruit aisle. And ask them a simple question. Would you eat this apple if it was sprayed with poison? And I would say probably 100% of those children would say no. They would understand what poison is. Uh, they've, they've seen Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They know. And, um, but it's stuff that they can't see. And you have to explain that to them, that this is stuff that you're not gonna be able to see uh, in the produce department, in the meat, in the chips, um, and that you really have to make a decision based on the labeling of this food, that you have to choose organic if you wanna avoid poison. The scariest thing about GMOs that really got me was knowing that there is corn being planted here in the United States that is injected with BT toxin, which this is an insecticide that's inside the corn kernel, inside the seed. So when an insect tries to eat it, their stomach explodes. I was terrified when I learned this, that if an insect's stomach is exploding when they eat this type of seed, or when they try to eat it, what's really happening to our own bodies when we do eat it. And that was really frightening. And that is something that hasn't been tested long-term on humans, that in all laboratory studies of animals, it produces horrendous results, and is something that should be completely outlawed. And if not outlawed, we should definitely have labeling so we can make a decision whether we want to eat that type of corn or not. You know, Asking that question, and even asking parents that question, you know, would you serve this to your children? They will say no, but what they don't see is what's really killing them and really killing us as a group. You know, that's the reason why the president's cancer panel, who determines why Americans are getting cancer every year, have said 41% of us are destined to have cancer in our lifetime because of these toxic chemicals in our environment. If these type of um, situations are explained to children and the truth is told to them, they're really going to make better informed decisions. It's really hard for a child to, to look at something and not be able to see it. And in the case of meat, uh, how it's grown and produced in this country, whether it's the cows being fed genetically engineered grain or the chickens or the pigs, or it's the way we treat our animals really poorly by giving them antibiotics, giving healthy animals antibiotics before they even get unhealthy because we're putting them in such inhumane situations where they're not supposed to survive normally. And explaining that to a child that this is what's really happening in the meat industry and telling them it's not really something that you can see 
It's something that your body will see when you eat it. And you know, when you're eating sick animals that are bred to be sick, you're also gonna become sick. Because if there are toxins in their blood and in their meat and in their protein and you're eating that, your body is also gonna become toxic and uh, is gonna start to cause you know, diseases. And um, one of the things that you know, I think is really crucial is to explain you know, mother nature to children of how animals are supposed to live and how, what animals are supposed to eat. You need to make sure that you're eating meat that isn't fed poison. And you need to choose organic, sustainable meat. With children, it's so important to like really just lay it out for them. Be really truthful because I think they really appreciate the truth. They're not scared of the truth. They don't uh, have the, the biases of so many people. Um, so you really can influence them very greatly. You know, in the chip aisle, you need to explain to them that the food in there has been engineered to make them want it more, to make them addictive to that type of chip, and that's been engineered in such a way that uh, profits the food industry and makes us sick, that they don't want to be duped. And, um, you know, nobody likes to be fooled, and I, I, including little children. They don't like to be fooled. And if you explain to them that the food industry is really playing all these tricks on them, and they start to realize that, hey, I'm not a fool. I'm not, they're not gonna play a trick on me. I'm gonna choose a better, safer version of the chips. Imagine uh, if the children of America started uh, rejecting all of the bad foods and the bad chemicals in food and started choosing non-GMO food and food that isn't reddened with toxic pesticides or engineered. Imagine if they start demanding that organic farming gets subsidies by the government. Imagine if we start to reject all of this corn and soy being grown here and we start to embrace community gardens, embrace growing something yourself, embrace planting sprouts because they're so easy. Imagine if all of these kids started caring about what they ate and saw the connection of what they're eating to their health and whether they wanted to spend that money now on food versus later on pharmaceutical drugs. And that awakening can occur, and it is occurring, because when I was young, I didn't have access to this information. I had to find it out through a back way and through my own self-experimentation. But now this information is there. It's, it's, a, it's a, just a Google away. And will totally have the opportunity to change the world. Imagine a world where, you know, a child goes to, to lunch and talks about their lunch in a really positive way and how their choices, them eating a non-GMO meal or an organic meal is changing the world and them telling their friends about that. And imagine their friends telling other friends about it and, and talking about what's really happening to our food supply and what brands are doing the right things and what brands are doing the wrong things. Imagine a world where um, the children, really their purchasing decisions influence the entire market and change the market share from the bad uh, toxic foods to the really great foods, the organic non-GMO foods. Could you imagine every single corner having a place that you could actually eat at that you wouldn't be exposed to GMOs? One of the things that has made me so successful, being able to share my investigations is other people who care about this information who share it. And, and if I were to give one piece of advice for a child who understands what's happening in the food supply and in our pharmaceuticals and everywhere, I would tell them to tell another friend about it. Because that's how this information catches wildfire. And to make their choices known and not to be afraid to be the oddball out that's eating a certain way because you really could be the front runner and you'll be the person who is healthy when it comes down to it. Growing up, I had all of these ailments. I was on all these prescription drugs and to know that I could have spent all of that money, the 400 plus dollars I spent at the pharmacy, at the drugstore every single month, to know that I could spend a portion of that money towards organic food to even allow my body to feel better and heal naturally, but also to get off all of those pharmaceutical drugs and to feel the best I've ever felt in my life, to, 
to be able to explain that to a little child, to explain it to someone that maybe they haven't experienced any heartache yet, any physical ailments or any health issues yet, to explain to them that if they were to be proactive and spend money where it really matters, on the food that they're putting in their body, that that is their medicine, that food is their medicine to prevent them from ever having to spend crazy amounts of money on medical bills and health issues, to be able to convince them that buying it now versus paying it later is better would be the most amazing thing because what they would realize is that they would prevent so many different diseases and different issues within their lives. And what they would do is they would really shift the mindset of our entire health industry from a very um, Band-Aid type focus mentality of you know, covering up symptoms and treating symptoms to going to a more preventative model. And if kids can learn to do that with their food, to, to teach them that ginger you know, is anti-inflammatory and can help a headache and it can make your, you know, your muscles heal faster versus going for Advil, the options are endless. And that's why I tell my story about how I was 22 on almost eight prescription drugs and feeling so bad about myself, my body, my health, I had no energy, suffering all these ailments, not looking beautiful, not feeling the best I've ever felt. And saying that, you know, I was 10 years younger feeling that way and I feel better now than I did 10 years ago and explaining to them that they can really feel amazing for, the, for their entire life. They have a choice. They can choose organic, non-GMO food. And they have a choice. Every single day, you determine what you put in your body. Nobody else determines that. Yeah, when you're a baby, you're, it's important that mothers choose the right type of food. But once you're able to feed yourself, that decision's yours every single time. And imagine giving that power to a child, saying every single time you eat, you get to decide your fate. You get to decide whether you're going to become a statistic or you're going to live the life that you are meant to live on this earth. There's so many people covering up symptoms and not getting to the root cause. And they're just, they're treating an ailment and not treating the thing that's really causing that ailment. And if they even knew the power of food and like what it could do to your body and how it can make you feel, I really feel like unlocking that power is so amazing. You know, there's this cycle, this normal cycle that has become a normality that needs to stop. That you start eating the industrialized food, you get sick, you go into the healthcare system, you get prescribed drugs, you start spending money on drugs, start feeding the pockets of the pharmaceutical industry, and that in turn feeds the government because the big pharma, big food, are all in the pockets of the government. You know, the person leading the FDA was former Monsanto. And the people who are making the decisions are being lobbied by these big pharmaceutical and big food companies. Kraft spent millions of dollars lobbying the FDA. You know, big major corporations, food corporations, spend millions of dollars every year lobbying the FDA for these decisions that are made about whether these chemicals are allowed in our food or not. You know, one of the things that I want to tell children is they don't have to be part of that revolving system. They don't have to be part of that normality that has become a really toxic part of our environment. They can actually break free of that whole system. They don't have to eat the industrialized food that makes them sick, that makes them buy the pharmaceutical drugs. They can eat the good food, the organic non-GMO food, and they don't even have to be part of the healthcare system. They can take control of their own health. They can take back their health. They can be preventative and live a really super healthy life and not be part of the system. You don't have to be part of the system. You can opt out. Gunnar, thanks for taking some time with us today. Great, great to be here. Thank you. Can you uh, tell us your name and give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, so my name is Gunnar Lovelace. Uh, you know, I've been an int interested in farming and social enterprise my whole life. Uh, I grew up really poor with a single mom and saw how hard she worked to make healthy choices. And when my mother remarried, my stepfather was running a food co-op out of a little hippie commune in Ojai, California. So I got to see firsthand the power of group buying as a way to make food more affordable and, and build community. 
And, you know, so many of the movements that came out of the organic and natural industry really started with the hippie movement. And I think, you know, what's been really exciting to see how that's going mainstream and that you've got consumers now that are voting with their dollars at scale. Uh, as I went on in my own entrepreneurial career, uh, you know, I've always been interested in food and health and started nonprofits and, uh, you know, I ended up dropping out of uh, college and started an educational software company teaching children how to read. And the whole time I was, you know, thinking about how do, how do we create a 21st century food co-op that keeps the heart and soul of the hippie movement but makes it more mainstream and accessible to uh, consumers everywhere. Uh, and, you know, just kind of philosophically, I've been looking for an organizing principle my whole life that brings people together at scale around the common good. And, you know, I, I really believe that expanding access to healthy food is, is one of those organizing principles. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, what you believe, what the color of your skin is. People want to feel good in their bodies and they want the same thing for their children. So it's been, you know, that's been kind of a, a general organizing principle for decisions that I've made in my own life and, and why we're here at Thrive Market today. So you talk about Thrive Market. So when did that, that idea occur to you? You know, it happened very organically. I, I've always been interested in healthy brands. And so I just, because I have another socially conscious jewelry company, I had a retail store. So I was able to set up wholesale buying accounts with a lot of my favorite brands. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, uh, just super organically, uh, it was for, for Burning Man. And, uh, you know, after I came back from Burning Man, you know, a lot of friends were interested in buying these brands at wholesale prices. And so I ended up running these shopping events on Facebook. And the demand for accessing these products was so high. I was, and the labor involved with filling people's orders. I wasn't trying to make money. I was just kind of like a service to my friends. Right. And uh, I felt like there's got to be a much simpler way to organize these types of processes at scale. And so that you know, really got me thinking that there was a real opportunity to uh, disrupt pricing in the health food industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then I partnered up with my, one of my co-founders, Nick Green. Uh, he and I have been you know, self-funded the business very early on. And you know, he's, a, he's like the, the perfect counterpoint to you know, college dropout from a hippie background, uh, from a hippie commune. He's you know Harvard grad, top rated debater in the whole country in high school. His parents are still married, very suburban background, you know, just beautifully stable human being by comparison. So we're great partners. And as we went out to raise money, uh, we were rejected by over 70 of the top New York, L uh, San Francisco, LA uh, venture capital firms. It was you know obviously a pain in the neck, but it was the best thing that ever happened to us because we ended up bringing our first $10 million of capital came from this group of 150 mega bloggers that you know, are in the business of sharing health and wellness information with their audiences. And they hear from their communities, hey, we want to live a lifestyle, but we can't afford to do it or we're not near a health food store. So they understood the problem in a different way that venture capitalists did who said, why don't you just go to Whole Foods? Like they just didn't understand the problem. Right. Um, and so that was a really interesting for us, it was ultimately the best thing to be rejected by all these venture capital firms because it allowed us to bring, to build a truly stakeholder driven business around solving this problem. You know, how do we actually make organic groceries available at 25 to 50% off? And that's really our mission is to make healthy living accessible to everybody and democratize access. Uh, and so we launched the business two and a half years ago. You know, we've uh, just exploded with our growth. You know, there's 500 employees where there was one employee out of my house, uh, you know, a little more than three years ago. And, you know, we've been blessed to raise over $160 million from very value aligned investors who really authentically care about what it is we're doing and recognize how big the problem is. You know, as you know, we spend $300 billion a year on diabetes related illnesses is just one of several major lifestyle diseases that are you know, largely driven by dietary habits. Mm -hmm. So we're bankrupting ourselves with the way that we eat. And there's now 7 billion of us on the planet. And you know, we're, it's absolutely incumbent that we change the way we produce, distribute, market, and consume food if we're going to pass a healthy world uh, off to our children. So our, our business is really focused on uh, really making that accessible in an aspirational way. So the way that we think about our business is, can we sell organic and healthy alternatives at the same price as conventional equivalents and ship it to people's homes for free? 
And the answer is yes, we sell a Kind bar with five grams of sugar for less than a candy bar. We sell 70 loads of non-toxic laundry detergent for less than 70 loads of laundry detergent with hormone and endocrine disruptors. So we're, we're uh, in this really beautiful sweet spot historically where a consumer is a member who's part of Thrive is able to access organic groceries at the same price as conventional equivalent for the first time in history and have it delivered to their home nationally. So that's you know been an incredibly gratifying experience, obviously very humbling. Uh, and we've you know made lots of mistakes along the way, sure. but that's kind of the, the core piece of what we do. So and, and incidentally, uh, we're, we're sitting here in your offices. I just want to say that you know, I visit a lot of businesses and this is really an impressive place. I love the environment. Uh, yeah, you can hear you know, the activity going on around us, uh, you know, the open format, but the, the vibe that you're communicating, you feel it when you walk in and experience the employee culture, which is really wonderful. Was there a particular um, personal, like when you were a consumer on the other side of this equation, like some frustrations that you were having that somehow guided your actions in creating Thrive? So, you know, just really personal at a very early age, a lot of survival trauma, you know, wasn't clear where food was going to come from a lot of the time and seeing my mother struggle. I mean, that, that is just an incredibly powerful thing to go through. And, you know, just really seeing her struggle to make healthy choices. And, you know, I was blessed in that even in the midst of our financial poverty, she still had the understanding that it was important to prioritize. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we weren't eating processed food and, you know, we would just be eating very simply. It might be rice and veggies for months on end, but at least she understood that it was really important to make those types of decisions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our model um, is that we literally cut out all the middlemen in the supply chain. So, you know, in, you know, traditional grocery retail has, you know, brokers, manufacturers, brokers, distributors, retail markup, and then all the pay to play games that happen on the shelf space that inflates the cost dramatically. And so we're able to drive prices down dramatically lower because we buy from the brands, we put them into our warehouses where we have one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, and then we ship to our members and we cut out all of that markup in the supply chain. And so our members pay $60 a year as our profit center, kind of like a big box shopping club. So for $5 a month, you get access to the platform and you get to buy your favorite highest quality organic and non-GMO groceries at wholesale prices. But for us, we felt like if you couldn't afford the membership, we didn't, we didn't want that to be a reason for you not to be able to have access. So for every paid membership, we give a membership away to a low income family. That's awesome. and, and that's, you know, just, you know, one with something we believe in and, and something that we know our members believe in. Which is a perfect segue about, uh, you know, saying that you can access, you know, non-GMO foods. Um, and this is something that I think uh, out of everybody that we've been talking about through this project, you'd have a real context for, uh, is the demand for non-GMO foods. So through Thrive and your large audience out there who are purchasing from you, what are you finding as far as the demand for non-GMOs? Yeah, so um, what's been really exciting to see is that this is a really bipartisan issue. You know, you look at survey data, 85 plus percent of Americans want to be able to know if their food has GMOs in it. They want food to be labeled, like this is known statistical data. Mm -hmm. So this is an issue that really cuts to conservative and liberal demographics. Um, and so, uh, and I think the, the flip side of that is that, you know, as you know, 95% of Americans are now testing positive for glyphosate right. in their urine. So the idea that we're gonna be engineering food crops to withstand systemic poisoning is, is the definition of insanity. Right. And in you know, less than three years that we've been live, publicly available to our members, you know, we've become the largest retailer in the country that sells exclusively non-GMO groceries. And in that two and a half years, we're the top five or top 10 sales channel of 90% of the brands in the space. Wow, so, so I just wanna make sure I understand. Yeah. So you're saying that everything that people buy from you is non-GMO? Yeah, yeah, we're the, we are the largest retailer of exclusively non-GMO uh, uh, groceries in the country. Wow, well, that's, that's huge because it's, uh, the labeling issue is a big issue. And to me, it's, it's really a moral issue as far as saying, you know, uh, is it not appropriate to label what's inside and you're trying to hide that from people so they don't know what they're buying? So that, that's like an oasis for, I think, parents especially, especially moms who are trying to be healthy, you know, responsible for the health of their household, 
to know that anything they're going to buy from from Thrive is not going to have GMOs in it. That's right. And is that a stand you took basically? Uh, is that, right from the beginning. Yeah, right from the beginning. So it's a yeah. part of your vetting process, yeah. saying anything that we're going to carry, that's one of the one of yeah, the yeah. And, and we've we've removed top selling brands that bullshitted us yeah. that said that they were non GMO, and we found that they weren't. And, really. And they were top selling brands. We're like, sorry, we cannot offer you to our community. Period. End of story. So that's that's been an incredibly uh, core part of what we do now. I'm not against an engineering food. Like that's not like we're not we're not black or white about this. I mean, as a species, we have been uh, genetically engineering food and animals for hundreds and thousands of years. It's the nature of selection, grafting. Like this is the nature of doing these things. But the idea that we're going to engineer food crops like corn, soy, wheat, cotton to withstand systemic poisoning and the destruction of topsoil, the infiltration into water systems, and 90 plus percent of uh, Americans now testing positive for glyphosate through these Roundup Ready crops that are now in all the big CPG, all the packaged goods companies are using Roundup Ready crops as part of their supply chain, which is why glyphosate is entering into people's food and it's why it's showing up in their urine. Um, you know, that to me is the definition of insanity. And so as, as a business, what we wanted to be very clear on from day one is that you know, we understand that there's a real concern about this. We understand that there's a real uh, trust and deficit gap in the market. People don't know who to trust. I mean, you get genetically engineered food at Whole Foods. You get genetically engineered food at Amazon. You get genetically engineered food at a lot of your favorite health food stores. Um, and so we wanted to be absolutely clear that when you buy at Thrive Market, you don't have to think about it. Like, we've done that work. We sort every single product in our catalog by over 180 certifications and qualities wow. and non-gmo is one of those like that's just the baseline um, and so you know for us though what's also been cool is because the market has grown so quickly uh, we have become a top five or top ten sales channel for 90 percent of the brands in the market these are the biggest organic brands in the market so you know we're showing up in their boardroom conversations we're a major sales channel which really gives us an opportunity to have a dialogue with manufacturers out there like hey how do we make this better how do we do things better how do we clean up our supply chains you know these are brands that are already committed to non-gmo but you know now now we need to go beyond organic and non-gmo we need to talk about regenerative agriculture and we right. need to talk about building topsoil and how do we clean up packaging and how do we lower the amount of waste that we produce so this is really because we're now you know such a major sales channel for most of these brands we're able to have really great conversations with them where they're willing to make investments and changes because they know that we can drive volume to them. So the code that you crack basically is that typically to try to take those type of positions um, from a, you know, call it a conscious capitalism standpoint, uh, simultaneously uh, to, you know, the costs are high, you have to, you're paying a, a burdened cost to be able to have these types of foods, to to work with a you know company that cares about you know regenerating you know uh, topsoil, et cetera, but you, you found a way to make it affordable, as you're saying, almost you know maybe even cheaper than conventional uh, you know purchases uh, at, at a grocery store, and still deliver that type of quality nationally Na on a national a national level. scale. We ship nationally from day one, well. and the, the most basic way that we measure our success is can we sell a healthy alternative at the same price as a conventional equivalent and ship it to people's homes for free? At the end of the day, it's all about access, and sure. we see access as a function of price, geography, and education. Yeah. Price in that we're selling previously premium products for less, geography in that we ship nationally if people are in food deserts or they're in remote locations, and education in that we invest, we've invested millions of dollars in content that informs and inspires people. So that's recipes, it's DIYs, it's courses. You know, it's not only about the technical, functional, logistical aspect of actually getting the food, it's why does it matter? What's the truth about health, saturated fats? You know, why should I care about toxic ingredients in my, in my cleaning supplies? How do carbs turn into sugar? Uh, right. What is glyphosate? What, right. like, what are these things? Right. And that was, the, uh, I was going to ask, is there an educational dimension to your activities? Because, you know, in, in our project, in GMOs Revealed, that's really what we're trying to do is bring attention to saying, you know, this is a 
fairly serious matter, very serious matter, and has significant consequences, not just today, but well into the future when you look at how long glyphosate lives yeah. in, the, in the environment. Yeah. It's in, as you said, you know, tested 90% of people are testing, it's in their bodies, and this is a highly toxic substance. So uh, how are you finding that people are responding to the educational side? Are they engaging? Are oh, they yeah. getting it? It's a, I mean, I think that there's, first of all, there's just a lot of, there, there's this really in, in, um, exciting millennial consumer trend that's happening. And we see millennial as a mindset, not as an age group. Right. So that, that means that people are voting with their dollars and they're voting with their values. Mm -hmm. I think even just to kind of take a step back, you know, I think it's really interesting to look at the historical perspective of where we are as a species. You know, we've been on the planet for about 200,000 years, uh, and for the vast majority of that time, we've been hunter-gatherers with less than a billion of us on the planet at any given time. So only with the advent of agriculture you know, about 9,000 years ago, do you go from, you know, very, very small hunter-gatherer social frameworks to people concentrating in a geographic region, being able to produce more food, the, the, the construct and creation of a city, business, trade, commerce, agriculture is at the center of that. And when you look at our population boom, you go from 9,000 years ago to the birth of Jesus Christ, there's about a billion of us on the planet, and you go to World War II, about 1900, 1900 years later, 1945, you have about two and a half billion people on the planet. Uh, you fast forward another 70 years to present day, from World War II to today, 2017, there's more than 7 billion of us on the planet. This is driven by the agricultural revolution. This is driven by our ability to produce a lot of food. And this just really kind of gives it, for me, as kind of an interest, as somebody who's interested in human evolution, I think it's a really valuable context for us to think about, you know, what happens when we go to 10 billion people or 13 billion people and people continue to eat the way that we are or there continuing to be a lot of factory farming of animals, you know, what, what are the implications of that? And what we do know is that there's all sorts of studies coming out now that we're destroying topsoil at a historic rate mm -hmm. and that there's studies coming out showing that we only have 60 harvests left on the planet. And so the way that we are producing, distributing, and marketing and consuming food is going to leave this planet completely unsustainable for us and for our children. And so it's absolutely, you know, I think that the, the GMO conversation around glyphosate, around Roundup, around other herbicides, around the engineering of food crops to withstand poisoning of, because, you know, I think Monsanto is going to lose the battle on Roundup. Yeah. Like, the, I, to me, it's like definitively clear. They, they are going to lose this battle. But the, the challenge is that there are other, other ingredients behind that yeah. which um, we need to be out there publicly advocating and educating around. And so as a brand, we're investing in these types of conversations with you, with our influencers, with our bloggers, with our doctors, with our membership community, with our brands, with our investors. How do we galvanize a synchronized conversation around these issues in a way that actually makes a real impact? So um, with the impact that you want to have, obviously, you've laid out quite clearly as far as getting healthy foods to people at prices that they're already, you know, spending or less, and right. making it accessible, which was an issue. Uh, you know, I, I grew up uh, in the '70s. My father was like the weird guy who owned a health food store in awesome. town. You know, yeah, so, so it was you, a, you understand. Oh, I totally get yeah. it. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, like a weird thing that if I went to school with Tiger's Milk Bar type of thing. So right. you see the, the change in in how things emerge and. and trends will emerge yeah. culturally, but simultaneously you, you see these, these uh, malevolent corporate interests that start to take control of literally our food supply. Um, so it, it feels, at least to me, like a little bit of a David and Goliath. I mean, here you are saying, I, you, know, you clearly understand the issues, you clearly understand the challenges for the typical consumer that's out there. I don't think anybody says, I don't care about my health. I think they do care, but the question is, what is their access to be able to do something about it? Yeah. And, and you said something interesting, though. You said Monsanto loses, you know, and, and maybe is that, and do you feel that way because just the, 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 the truth and the trends are such that there's no way that they can sustain their particular position doing what they're continuing to do and poisoning people throughout the world? Or why do you say that? I mean, I think we're in this really exciting time where it's really hard to hide things. Mm -hmm. And the internet is at the center of that. The, the ability to drive transparency into supply chains, into real motives, like it's just impossible to hide things mm -hmm. at scale. And um, I think consumers are becoming increasingly sophisticated 
And so, you know, they want to vote with their dollars with yeah. the companies that represent their values. They're also naturally cynical of greenwashing and, and bullshit. Yep. And, um, you know, that's something that we think about a lot in terms of how we make our investments and communicate with our communities. Mm -hmm. But I think that, um, you know, the, the amount of news and information that's coming out around Roundup and Monsanto is just, it's so, such a critical inflection point. I mean, you know, California has finally won its lawsuit with Monsanto, so it's going to be labeled under Prop 65. Back in February of 2017 of this year, you know, Monsanto was caught with the EPA official that was, you know, writing, you know, papers around uh, certifying it as a safe, as a safe, as Roundup and glyphosate is safe. Right. Th this, this is the, this is the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Now, I think it might take another two or three years for it to really unwind itself, or maybe even ten years. Yeah. But the truth is that they're going to lose this battle. Yeah. Um, now. They're used to losing battles. Like they were, these are the guys that did DDT. Right. So they, they understand that there's a cyclical nature to this, right. and it's incumbent upon us as people who care, people who have these incredible reach, uh, and then just the power of our social networks and being able to communicate. You know, I think we're in a position as value-aligned consumers, and I'm talking broadly, not just Thrive Market, but just right. the, the emerging consumer dynamic where people can use the internet to drive transparency and use social media to have things go viral. We're in a position to hold businesses accountable in a way that has never existed historically. And you see this now with all the big CPG brands and the retailers, they're all in serious trouble. They are facing existential threats. You look at share price and challenges that McDonald's and Coca-Cola face. Yeah. You know, they're buying companies up left and right. They don't know what to do. They know that there is a tectonic shift happening, and it's very hard for a big, entrenched, multi-billion dollar player to speak authentically to this emerging consumer dynamic without threatening their existing business. And so it's, this is a really, really interesting dynamic time where there's going to be a lot of carnage in the market, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's great for consumers. Yeah, it needs to be disrupted yeah. completely. Now, do you feel like with the activities that you are engaged in with your business and on, on the philanthropic side, do you feel like you're, you're basically giving confidence to more and more farmers to, to move in the direction saying, since you're a market maker at this point and you're, you're getting the message out, you're creating an audience, you're, you're finding uh, business systems that, can, uh, that, that will work from an economic standpoint uh, at scale. Yeah. And now what happens is if you're a farmer saying, I don't like living under the thumb of a Monsanto and paying patent fees for seed yeah. and spraying the hell out of the soil. I mean, I mean, a farmer's got to understand the damage they're doing to the earth more than anybody else, right? Because they live it every day. So is it a part of, of, at least a part of your intention to say that we want to give confidence that, that farmers can start making a switch to a healthier crop, a healthier way of farming, et cetera, because we're building the audience to sell for them. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And you see, you know, other retailers are also doing big forward buys now, like Costco just did a big deal where they're providing lending instruments and making big forward buys to provide stability for farmers to, to really provide organic uh, yeah. crops. That's a great thing. Yeah. I think that's a really, really great thing. And you know, we're, to your point, it is David versus Goliath. You know, yeah, we've raised a lot of money, we've had a lot of success, but we're like a little gnat. Yeah. You know, we're in a market, $45 billion market, of just the categories we sell into on the organic side alone. And even at that size, it's less than 5% of conventional food sales. And of conventional food sales sold online, half of 1%. So this is a trillion dollar market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our core thesis is that organic and healthy living is like lifestyle. It is a, it, like fashion, it's a lifestyle trend. It's a secular movement. Mm -hmm. It's a mainstream event and a phenomenon. And so in that, in, in that if, if one believes that, uh, we're in an increasingly powerful position to drive positive change all the way down into the farmers. You know, for example, we're trying to source a very specific type of regenerative hog uh, jerky, bacon jerky product. We couldn't find a farmer that could provide the scale that we need for our community. Mm -hmm. So we've been helping the farmer put together a co-op of all of their other farmers that have the same practices so that you know, they can benefit by working together and that we can have enough scale to supply our community. So there's, you know, in every particular supply chain, there's different types of issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the truth is that the farmer is actually the ones that are getting squeezed. Yeah. You know, they, they, are, they are being squeezed in this. Um, and, you know, the, the challenge is 
we still have to create more pathways for farmers to be able to earn comparable livings than they are uh, using Roundup Ready crops. And that's still, that's still a process that needs to be refined. Well, what I love about this conversation is, you know, we've done so many interviews for this project and, uh, and it's very polemic, you know, people talking about all the challenges, the problems, the toxicities, and, you know, it, there is a validity to the sky is falling relative to the dynamics of what's going on. But here you come and you sit at the table and, and you're, you're really uh, creating momentum behind solutions to transcend the problem bring, bring uh, you know, uh, Goliath down, if you will, and, and create a consumer force that allows you know, an emergence of, of, a, of a transformation, really, which is, I think, horribly needed right now in the world. So it's, I'm really glad that we have this dimension of the conversation yeah. coming in here, and I, I think it's just extraordinary, the work you're doing. So um, what is your vision now? Like, push it out maybe 10 or 15 years. How do you want to see things working, and, and what's the role that Thrive is playing? Well, I, th I think the, the, the general trend of people voting with their dollars and voting with their, with their values is just going to scale. Mm -hmm. And I think any business that doesn't understand how to speak directly to consumers, how to use e-commerce, uh, that isn't investing in organic and healthy living alternatives, they're, they're just going to be gone mm -hmm. in 10 or 15 years. Yeah. It's just literally that simple. Um, and so you know, that's a great thing for people that are developing those competencies and are willing to really put their money where their mouth is and invest in it. And there, you know, there are there are CPG companies that actually really do get it. Like I'm not inherently against these companies buying small uh, emerging progressive brands. I actually, you know, there's a lot of concern. And it's understandable in the market. Oh, you know, General Mills buys Annie, and that's a bad thing for Annie's. I don't actually see it that way. I actually see that Annie's is infecting the mothership with right. its values, and I know that to be the case because we work with Annie's and we work with General Mills and we see the values that are being reflected in General Mills as a result of their acquisition of Annie's. And so, you know, yes, there's more discipline and process from a like strictly capitalistic framework that's happening for some of these brands that are being, that are being acquired, but the actually really exciting thing is the values of a lot of these brands are actually percolating in and affecting the mothership. And so I think that's a really positive dynamic. And a lot of times these bigger companies are making these acquisitions because they recognize that they got a problem right. and that they have to change their ways and that they need to bring new DNA and new perspectives and new understanding about how to communicate with this emerging consumer market. So I think you know, in a, in a perfect world, if I were to wave my wand in 10 or 15 years from now, you know, this general secular trend of consumers voting with their dollars and voting with their values will just continue to magnify, magnify such that no company, no consumer packaged good company, no retailer can get away with the same, you know, negative externalities that they get in, away with today. You know, the problem with our consumer economy today and capitalism 1.0 is the real costs of the products are not reflected in the price that we pay. Mm -hmm. And this is because these, these costs are shouldered off. You know, if I'm producing cattle and my uh, corn is subsidized and uh, there's all sorts of other subsidies that are a, a part of the process uh, and I'm not paying for the downstream costs of the factory farming of the animal feces and the dead zones and uh, the health concerns that are coming up 10 to 20 years down the road. This is the challenge with uh, the current capital framework. And so we have all these negative externalities where the attribution window for how the prices and the costs of those products aren't being properly reflected. What's great about this massive exponential uh, movement of consumers voting with their dollars is that the companies that are going to succeed are naturally thinking about the real costs that they have. Yeah. And, and that's going to be really powerful for our economy. It's going to be really powerful for pe people's health. It's going to be really important for environmental issues. Conventional agriculture today is the second largest contributor of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So this shift to organic, non-GMO, regenerative supply chains will really strengthen uh, our economy will strengthen our health and will strengthen the, in the environmental position that we're in. And so my hope, what we're investing in uh, and what the hats that I wear both as a founder and a stakeholder in Thrive Market, but also just as a, a human concerned about human consciousness and, and the success of our species is that these movements become so strong so quickly that it becomes uh, so obvious to capital at scale 
that we need to continue to invest in these things. And, and I think that that's the good news is the market's going to win on that one. Yeah, it, it seems like um, there's a, a, a true free market that's emerging uh, as compared to the crony capitalism where you got you know Monsanto buying off right. you know EPA officials, right. et cetera. But and you know I, I also will agree that I think consumer behavior will start to drive the outcomes more so than a few people who control everything you know the, the way that they do and the way that they want to, playing a master of the universe as compared to serving people and letting that drive you know the whole economics of, of uh, what's going on in this in the food markets and other markets. But, uh, but it's interesting that, and I think you, you kind of said this, and this is, the, this is, I think, the interesting slant because, again, we've been very often having the big bad wolf conversation around companies like Monsanto and Bayer's now going to, you know, looking to buy Monsanto and, you know, what all those dynamics might mean. And, and you know, people are afraid of that, and rightfully so. It's, it's fraught with all kinds of challenges yeah, that could be real, ir real problems. irreparable. That's an acquisition <laughs> I'm not in favor of. No, no, exactly. Me, me either. Yeah. So, um, but what's interesting is uh, also the recognition of that these you know big you know some of these mega companies are sort of seeing that they could be you know pretty much destroyed pretty quickly over a consumer rebellion, and that they they can't just decide that they're going to dictate to you know their customers how it's going to be, but their customers are going to push them into you know different directions. So. Uh, and as you said, you know, I, I remember, it, and this started a while ago, I, you know, there's a, uh, presentations I was given in the 90s when I started looking at health clubs, health foods, drinking water changes, but when I saw Pepsi and Coca-Cola starting to bottle water and sell it, I realized, wow, you know, it's amazing that right. the consumers are driving their behavior as compared to them saying, you know, have a Coke and a smile. Right. So, uh, and, and now I, I think there's a big momentum behind that, and that's why uh, you know, I'm very bullish on Thrive as far as you know, what you guys are gonna be able to do and, and the, the wind that's gonna be in your sales because of, and I think that's values driven also, and I think you, you've mentioned it a few times. So uh, the reason I'm even characterizing this because I have the scope of the whole project and listening to what you're saying is that um, I'm, I know that there's potential doom and gloom you know, with what's gone on, but at the same time, I think there's rays of, of great hope for how we can literally overcome these problems and, and have a better planet and, yeah. and a healthier planet as a consequence. Yeah, I mean, look, the dark is dark, the light is light, and this is, these are these incredibly dynamic times, you know, that, that, that great Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Yeah, right. you know, I, I really think that we are the most fortunate uh, generation of humans in the history of our species and we're so powerful we have such incredible capabilities and the only thing that limits us is our ideas about ourselves and the fears that we have and insecurities and I wrestle with that myself all the time you know I'm forced to confront my own insecurities and, ad and, and inadequacies all the time sure. and I think that as a species we're so enormously powerful individually and collectively and I think as a society, we're being forced to think about ourselves as we instead of me. And you know, that's, that has so many different implications in, in terms of how we think about it. And I think just, you know, just kind of an interesting change that's happened over the last 30, 40 years, you know, 60s, 70s, you had this whole spate of successful government regulation, EPA, Clean Water Act, and, you know, these are things that just would never get done today. Mm -hmm. These were bipartisan Republican Democrat uh, initiatives that were passed and really like, created a circumstance where we have a, a, just a, a, a step level function improvement in the way we take care of our, our systems. You know, that was able, those are things that were able to get done 30, 40 years ago as top down. Same thing with you know, conventional packaged good companies and mega corporations were able to drive things top down. The era of that is over. And we're now, you know, the, the downside of this intense political dysfunction is that things that, you know, we expect our politicians to be reasonable and get things done for us, they're not going to be able to do it. And so at the end of the day, I think one of the things that's really driving this massive movement towards voting with dollars and values is that people recognize that that's a place that they have power. Mm -hmm. And they recognize that it doesn't actually take that many of them to create awareness around an issue. And you see that with petitions now. You have people like... Food Babe or other people that run petitions and then the boards of directors of big CPG companies are being forced to respond or remove a product from their supply chain. Mm -hmm. you know, they are terrified of consumer pressure. And uh, as, as there's intense gridlock and dysfunction at a national level, top-down, corporations, politicians, there's this incredible 
grassroots movement that I think is totally misunderstood and that is going to be an incredibly powerful force that's beneficial to people that understand how to communicate and to tap into it and, and are authentic and real. Yeah, and, and you know, something you cited which is really interesting is that individual rights doesn't necessitate individual action. You can, you know, we can have individual rights, but there can be a we in the actions that we want to take based on common values right. that people care That's about. Right. So, because a lot of people think, well, you know, then, then somehow we have to surrender individual, you know, individuality or individual rights, and the answer is no. You know, we're free to act, but we're free to commune and act also, which is what I think is really going on. Yeah. So that, that's it's exciting times. Like you said, maybe interesting times. Exactly. <laughs> it's a, it's a, like a very old Chinese curse. <laughs> For sure. So, um, what is uh, any anything that you can tell us uh, that you guys are doing that uh, is on your drawing board that you're allowed to talk about publicly yet? That uh, yeah, people I mean, who would watch this would be interested. Yeah, even, just kind of uh, just just a little bit more historical context in terms of like the investments that we do as a business. You know, not only do we see ourselves as an e-commerce utility that drives incredible price on these previously premium products, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're constantly, as uh, stewards of the brand and of the business, studying other businesses that we think have been really successful. So Patagonia, I think, is one of the touchstones in terms of being a really authentic, iconic brand that has really made markets. I mean, they invented the organic cotton industry is just one example. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, uh, we constantly challenge ourselves to think about how can we build an iconic brand that speaks to the values of this emerging consumer dynamic in a way that's true to us, but also really meets the needs of the market and meets the needs of our members? Uh, and an example of that was, you know, 50% uh, of the families in our giving program that we give free membership for are on SNAP. They're on food stamps. Mm -hmm. This is a classic example of the digital divide. Here you have a very, you know, you have 21st century economy where you can buy anything online, but you can't use your food stamps to get healthy food for less. Right. And we had been working with the USDA to take, like, this is crazy. Like, well, let's let's get, we'll invest in it, we'll pay for it, you know, let's make this happen. Um, and uh, And as a result, because we couldn't get positive response from the USDA on this, we ran a big campaign to get food stamps online mm -hmm. and we were able to do something really unique where we were able to leverage this big influencer army of folks that had invested in the business propelled the vis business into the public mind at scale we were able to take this community and really promote this issue in a way that you know drove a billion media impressions we drove 300,000 petition signatures we had op-eds from the Washington Post down writing about, hey, we need to end this digital divide. Like, we need to be able to make sure people can get healthy food online. Right. And then we worked with a bunch of our celebrity partners. And, you know, they created funny short PSAs, like highlighting all the crazy things you can buy online, but what can't you buy? Healthy food with food stamps. <laughs> right. But what was really interesting for us, and kind of as, as, as we've continued to educate ourselves, is that we were very careful about how we language the campaign. It wasn't a classic conservative or liberal campaign. We really framed it in a way that we wanted to bring everybody to the fold on the table. And so our framing was, hey, if, if we're gonna have a federal program that gives people food, we need to make sure the food that they get doesn't cause them to get sick so taxpayers pay more money. Right. And this is a message that resonates to everybody. Sure. And as a result of the campaign and the success of the campaign, you know, we hosted a congressional briefing with 100 Republican and Democratic offices on Capitol Hill. And as a result of the campaign, we, within 90 days of our campaign, we had the USDA coming out committing to get food stamps online. Mm. That was really exciting. You know, we're, we're a two-year-old startup yep. that has positively affected an $86 billion federal program that touches the lives of 46 million Americans. Right. And um, you know, as a result of the success of the campaign, the Republican chairman of the House Ag Committee invited me to testify for three hour, for three hours in front of Congress uh, last November. And you know, I was talking about genetic engineering and talking about food stamps. Talk, these are the these are the types of issues that I was able to speak directly to uh, members of the House in in the Agricultural Committee, uh, about 30, 30 members. And so this. That whole campaign was just an amazing educational experience for us as we think about how, what are additional ways that we can galvanize our network of members, influencers, bloggers, doctors, brands, nonprofits. I mean, we worked with everybody on the nonprofit side from the Organic Consumer Association to Center for Food Safety to Environmental Working Group, all the biggest food advocacy groups to all the biggest brands in the space, to all the biggest bloggers. It was just an amazing 
amazingly gratifying experience. And, and so for us, as we think about what does it mean to demonstrate social enterprise at scale? What does it mean to show that we're a business with values? Uh, that was a really exciting learning experience for us. And so now we're thinking about, you know, what are the next campaigns that we're going to run? Um, and so I think as a brand, um, you know, that's a really positive story in the market in terms of, you know, here's, here's a way that a business can have really positive impact. It's, it's extraordinary, and the results are, are uh, also really impressive that you can get that done, because what, what gets done in Washington, you know, ever, you right. know, so the fact that you got that yeah. done, yeah. because, I mean, the, like you said, it's, it's so nonpartisan. I mean, who can not see the validity of, of doing, you know, of letting people buy healthier food with food stamps? Right. So uh, along those lines, maybe kind of now speaking to this audience and, you know, the, the people who are responsible for kids or households, et cetera, and are basically saying, oh my God, I'm like, they're drinking from a fire hose right now, right? All this data coming, all this information have a significant desire uh, to say that uh, they want to um, do something, you know, to upgrade the health of their household within the budget they have. What is like the low hanging fruit for the uninitiated? What's yeah. the first actions that a mom could take who's new to this to start down this path to upgrading their, the health of the food that they bring into the home? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a really basic thing, which is that, you know, it's all about habit formation. And so, you know, we have been bombarded as consumers with trillions of dollars of CPG advertising, conditioning us to eat processed food and processed carbs. This is the inherent place that we're at today. And so I think that the thing that we need to understand is that we need to eat food with way fewer ingredients. So the fewer ingredients listed, the better. Right. Uh, we need to be eating whole grains or uh, no grains at all, depending upon your dietary preferences. Um, and so I think that's like a really simple thing. You know, our, our diet today, like the breakfast is today, the American breakfast today is one of the most insidious meals that we have. It's no wonder that our kids have attention deficit syndrome. They're being fed carbs, complex carbs and sugar, and complex carbs turn into sugar. So, you know, I know how I am when I eat too much sweet, I can't even concentrate. Right. I'm like bouncing off the walls and then I crash. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, tens of millions of children that are being poisoned effectively with complex carbs and sugar as their first meal of their breakfast. They can't concentrate mm -hmm. uh, and then they get uh, then they get spoon-fed drugs that are supposed to help them for their attention deficits. Right. This is, and those foods are all made from Roundup Ready crops uh, that are pumping glyphosate into, into our children. So like very, 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 very simple thing is eat food with the fewest number of ingredients possible. Right. There are plenty of ways to make food delicious and tasty without buying things with lots of ingredients. Like that is the most basic thing that anybody can do. Uh, I think another key factor is to the extent that you can, you know, buy truly nutrient dense food from a local from a local farmer at a farmer's market, and then get everything else from from Thrive Market because you can get all the non perishable goods from us at wholesale prices, and then support a local farmer getting truly nutrient dense food, organic and non GMO food from from a farmer's market. Now, there's a lot of places where you don't have farmers markets, mm -hmm. uh, and so you know there are emerging services that are taking care of that, uh, and I think that's you know it's each each geographic region has slightly different solutions based upon what are the resources available there to get you know those critical you know vegetables and grains and meats and things like that uh, but the good news is that there's a lot of solutions emerging very quickly and consumers can very 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 simply shift their diet and the diet of their families from you know processed carbs to simpler whole foods mm -hmm. Eat as many veggies as possible. It doesn't matter if you're paleo or vegan. Right. We, we agree on that basic principle that we should be eating as many vegetables as possible uh, and we should be having as few complex carbs as possible. You know, the diabetes epidemic is just an incredibly insidious uh, destruction of human potential. You know, we spend $300 billion a year on diabetes related illnesses as just one of several major lifestyle diseases that are ravaging our communities and ravaging our economy. And that slight switch of like, hey, I'm gonna eat food that has fewer ingredients, that isn't as processed, that's not eating a lot of the complex carbs, that's the game changer right there. Um, and so those are just like a few very simple things that can be done. I think it's awesome advice. And, and uh, I think what you're doing in all your work is to make that simple. You know, take something that somebody might feel overwhelmed and make it simple for them to approach it and to start uh, engaging in it. So that's right. That's terrific. Yeah. 
Well, listen, after talking to you now, after many of these conversations, I got such hope awesome. <laughs> you know, for, and a positive yeah. outlook for what can be. And uh, I want to say that I know you're working passionately every day, so taking time out of your day to talk to us. It's, is, it's an honor. I yeah. mean, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank and you. and uh, we're grateful to be part of the conversation. It's a learning process for all of us. Yeah. Anybody who says what they know what they're doing in the 21st century is uh, BSing. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, our motto is uh, fail fast, succeed quickly. Yeah. We encourage our team to be courageous, make lots of mistakes, and share the learnings of those mistakes with everybody around them. And, you know, the only way that we're able to succeed is if we do this together. Right. Listen, thank you so much again uh, for sharing this wisdom and this vision, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. It's great to be here. I really hope you enjoyed episode one and were wowed by the information brought to you by these experts. And this is just the first day. Tomorrow is another mind-blowing day where we're going to escalate the information and the intensity of it because of the seriousness of the issue and what's at stake. So tomorrow I have part two of my interview with Dr. Zach Bush. And if you thought part one was good, wait till you see part two. Also, I interviewed Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey Smith is one of the most recognized figures in the world when it comes to the anti-GMO movement. He has entered debates on this issue. He's extremely articulate, and I love the way that he organized the information and presented it, so you want to catch that. And then we also have Dr. Dan Pompa. You need to look for solutions to the toxicity that GMOs present, and that's what Dr. Pompa is bringing to the table. His personal story related to this is very compelling. Tomorrow we have another spectacular day for you, and day by day the momentum of GMOs revealed is going to continue to build. But now there's something you need to do. You need to share this with your family and friends. This information needs to get out in the world. We are streaming it for free globally, but just because it's free doesn't mean that the information is not extraordinarily valuable. As a matter of fact, based on my experience in this series, this information is life-changing and life-saving. There's a lot at stake, folks. Your participation in making a small effort to share GMOs Revealed with your loved ones can make a big difference in their life. Just send them to gmosrevealed.com. It's free, but I can tell you that what we're going to deliver can make a huge difference in people's lives, and I will be there with you and them step by step by step throughout this entire process.